And this isn't a book yet, but uh, my father-in-law is a graphic designer and he just kind of automatically comes up with cool design things. So he sent me this little thing that looks like a book. Uh, and uh, this is my talk on how to make it in the new music economy. Uh, I think this is a great talk for anyone that's a musician, a young musician who's coming up uh, and an established musician, but also music consumers, people that listen to music, which I think hopefully is all of us. And uh, there's a lot of really great, great information in here. Uh, for you to know. And I think being purposeful about how we consume music can really help um, in just the general scheme of, of musicians being able to make it doing this thing. The uh, steps I see as the most important components to making a career in music, most of these transcend genre, but some of them are specific to people who specialize in art music, under which I think jazz would fall, uh, for better or for worse, actually. Uh, so on this uh, slide here, you can see it says tools for making it your life's agenda. Number one, practice. Number one, number two, start writing or composing. Number three, learn to use a DAW. We'll talk about what that is. Number four, perform and tour. Number five, record and release songs, albums, and videos. No small task. Number six, guide to pa uh, uh, is a guide to passive income for musicians, which is a big one. Uh, so the first one is practice. Number one on your list is your craft. The idea of making it, uh, the key to making it in any field is a steady path towards mastery. And this means consistent improvement of self from fundamentals to specialties on your instrument. I might even include here physical and mental health. Uh, for me, this meant developing my lead trumpet abilities while also be continuing to develop my harmonic understanding as an improviser and practicing bass and piano and composing. Whatever, whatever your medium, greatness in craft is a prerequisite for success. Ego is important here. You must have the audaciousness to get you to the stage to blow your horn, but the humility to recognize your weaknesses and work to improve them when you're in the practice room. As you'll see below, craft is not limited to one, uh, just one thing anymore. And here on the slide, it says, is ego bad? Well, ego is one of the things that gets us to the stage. It's the thing that gives us the confidence to put it out there. Is it bad? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. Ego is needed. I think you just need to leave it at the door when you head to the practice room. Here it says, what is craft? Uh, you play an instrument, it's being technically proficient, uh, so technically proficient that you can function in any musical situation. This can include many other things like learning to use a DAW or learning to compose, edit video, perhaps playing piano or another chordal instrument if you're a horn player. Uh, and then the third thing here, it says, I'm talking about practice, which is a Allen Iverson reference if you're a sports fan. One of the uh, things the pandemic has highlighted is how much practice I was doing from the stage and from rehearsals. Uh, performing and rehearsing with bands for hours each day helped me keep things like my trumpet lips in shape and practice has had a whole new meaning for me uh, and importance in a no gig economy. And I can say Adam has been practicing. You walk in the hallway, you hear it in his, in his, in his office, there that trumpet's going. He, he, he practices what he preaches. Yeah. Yep. Always got to be shedding the trumpet. Uh, so, Doc, you know, Doc Severinsen, the famous Doc Severinsen, who uh, led the Tonight Show band for a long time, he said, if I don't practice for one day, I notice. If I don't practice for two days, my band notices. And if I don't practice for three days, everybody notices. That's the that's the uh, <laughs> that's the the reality of being a trumpet player. Actually, I mean, it's not not so much the case if you're a flautist or a saxophonist. Uh, so, yeah, becoming a composer and a writer is really important. And composing could also fall under practice. Uh, because your career is not made in a day, practice is an integral part of establishing yourself and your music and your brand and your style and your thing. Uh, and continuing to commit to that thing, continuing to grow that thing over decades. And composition is something that you need to work on every day. You need to show up regardless of inspiration and write. Just as I was developing my voice as a lead funk jazz trumpeter and improviser, I was developing my voice as a composer. And the one continues to, the form, uh, to inform the other and vice versa. Uh, so here we said on the slide, it says, this is practice too. Yep, you have to practice this. You have to be methodical day in and day out. You must come back to write regardless of inspiration. What if I'm not inspired? Well, do you eat? Do you need to eat? Get inspired. Listening to a great album, go see a show. Listen to a great album. Go see a show. Look at some art that speaks to you. Read a good book. Take a walk outside. Uh, you can't wait for inspiration to write, but you can take steps to make sure that you're inspired. That's a big one. I think it's a really big one in any field is continuing to feed your soul so that you don't burn out. Uh, and especially now there's so much burnout uh, right now just because of what we've been in for the last two years. Uh, and then, of course, improvisation is the third one uh, in which I say composing is improvisation in slow motion. Think about it. Yeah. The next one is learn to use a DAW. And uh, a DAW is a digital audio workstation. Unfortunately, for the moder modern, uh, which is a program that you use to record yourself. 
Unfortunately for the modern musician, just being great at your instrument isn't enough anymore. Five or six years ago, a friend of mine who does some recording in Nashville for various artists told me that the expectation now is that you can sit at the console and edit your own parts on whatever DAW is being used in the studio once you're finished recording. You send the recording engineer home, you save some money, and then each person takes a turn editing their parts. Uh, I knew then that I had to build my own home studio and I had to learn how to use a DAW. And this, of course, coincided with the birth of my first boy, because when it rains, it pours, uh, who is now almost six years old. So I actually know exactly how long I've been working on uh, using DAWs and, and learning to use DAWs. Uh, I've done home recordings for now since then I've done home recordings for record labels for licensing companies for individual artists and for my own projects and not having to rely on a studio to record my music has really opened up a lot of opportunities in the last half decade and uh, you know I learned how to use the software primarily from watching YouTube tutorials. Um, that being said, none of it has really come close to matching the joy I get and the energy I feel from performing in a live situation so home recording is a great tool. I don't think it replaces live performance. That's a really important tool uh, for young musicians to learn now today. Uh, on the slide, you can see it says, learn to mix and master yourself and record using industry standard DAWs. I uh, explained what a DAW is, which one should I use? Well, that's a good question. Uh, you know, Pro Tools, I think is still the industry standard and Logic is a close second, which I think is debatable. Uh, probably some faculty members at Tech might debate that with me. I think they're primarily Logic users. Uh, but in the studio for recording, usually the, the, the DAW that's used is Pro Tools. And for people using sort of electronic music and using a lot of samples, then uh, Logic is a little bit more. Uh, there are all, many others as well. Uh, there are some ones that are free. Reaper is free. So if you're a musician looking to learn to record yourself, Reaper is a free DAW. Uh, you have a 75-day trial, and then you can continue saying you're, that you're trying, trying it. So it's not really free. I mean, you should probably pay for it eventually. Uh, why though? Well, home recording reduces your costs. It's amazing to be in the studio and I still do this with bands, but being able to record yourself means you're not bound to a studio in order to put down some sounds, which is a really important aspect. The next one is to perform and tour. Uh, performing can look different depending on the genre and the medium. There are many ways to build an audience now, but chief among them, despite the ongoing pandemic is, is performing live shows for people in person at a venue. And these, sh these kinds of shows still hold the most clout. The reason I think is because the sensation of live music is is different than what when music is consumed through other mediums. Uh, the energy of a room of 500 people uh, or a festival with thousands of people is irreplaceable, both for the performer and the audience. Pictured here is a shot of me performing a sold out show uh, at Prince's estate, Paisley Park, which is the picture on the right there. Uh, that's around a 500 person audience. Uh, this was also in the fall of my first semester at Tech. Um, this was the show. This was the first show at Paisley Park after Prince's passing, and we were honored to be chosen to kick that uh, show off. This is the band Nookie Jones, uh, and uh, the the other photo is me on the main stage of the Montreal Jazz Festival, where I performed with Youngblood Brass Band, uh, by far the biggest audience I've performed for, and that crowd just went on and on and on and on beyond those lights. It's really incredible. They had speakers down like a football field back. They had another set of speakers that projected the sound farther back. Uh, it was really an unreal experience uh, for me. It was just a handful of years ago. Uh, the next one is record and release songs uh, and albums and videos. Documenting your work is huge. And today, now more than ever, the model for success in the recording industry is to release as much music as you can as often as you can. With a caveat of maintaining the quality <laughs> to which you are beholden, which is probably different for everyone. Uh, Jacob Collier, one of the most successful artists who might be considered more in the art music genre than anything else, releases epic vocal and instrumental albums that he records and mixes himself in his bedroom. Certainly one of the most prolific current artists anywhere. Recently, he released a song that he recorded on his iPhone, just voice and guitar. In his words, I recorded this voice memo on my phone to distill the feeling of it, thinking I'd return to it someday to record a proper studio version. A few weeks ago, I sat down to give it a try, but nothing came even close to this warm, hissy voice memo feeling. And so here it is, out on all streaming platforms now. Uh, it, the, so now I'm talking. It's called The Sun Is In Your Eyes, and it's lovely, with virtually no fancy recording, mixing, mastering, or production techniques at play. Uh, so in a lot of ways, the quality of the recording itself, uh, there's a whole genre called lo-fi, which is almost... It's not, not necessarily low quality, but it's almost like, hey, this sounds like it was made in a home studio. And people like that. They seek that out. Uh, it's, it's almost become a genre. It's almost become a sound, a recording technique. 
A recent New York Times article points out that music and art has always been shaped by technology. We got our original song length at three minutes and 30 seconds from uh, uh, which even revered jazz artists like Duke Ellington and Louis Armstrong fit uh, from the amount of audio information that could fit on the very first records, gramophones. Today is no different. Artists are now uh, no longer paid by album sales. So CDs are fading fast and alternative physical merch items like vinyl, posters, shirts, cassettes and other nostalgic items are what sell at the merch table virtually or in person. Even silly things like Corey Wong's Smooth Jazz Starter Kit, which includes a fake mustache, some creamy almond butter, a cheap gold chain, and a cassette tape of some unreleased recordings. It sells for 25 bucks at the merch table. Okay, so now here's what I want to do. I want to release a poll because we're going to talk a little bit about Spotify. We're going to talk a little bit about streaming. Uh, so this is the poll here, and I believe Janet's going to launch it. Uh, we have a hip audience. Audience is keen to uh, keen to what is going on in the world. The it's actually E is the answer. It's actually six thousand dollars per one million streams. Uh, the here, let me see if I can get my stream back up. Here it is. Uh, the pay per stream rate for Spotify is point zero zero three cents between point zero zero three and point zero zero five cents per play. So for one million streams. About six thousand dollars. I saw some people. Some people chose a hundred thousand dollars. That's what it should be. That's what it should be. <laughs> um, but it's not. And uh, and I want to say too, just comparatively, that's one. That's one million. I mean, imagine working on a song, and then oh, and should I share the results? Do people want to see the results here? Um, that's okay. I'll take care of that. Okay. Uh, so, you know, one million. So imagine making a song, creating a song like uh like what I've just done and kind of pouring your heart and soul into it, getting a million streams and then getting not even enough money to pay your monthly mortgage for, for half a year. I mean, it's really an incredible amount of engagement and listening from fans and uh, an incredibly low amount of money in return. And I want to put it in context a little bit uh, here. You can see, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, if you sold 1 million downloads on iTunes, which is now basically not a thing there, that still exists, but people don't really go to iTunes and purchase music anymore. Uh, but you, you, you can. That was the, primarily like the way for a very small amount of time before streaming really became huge. People would go to go to download music and they would well, they would download it for free via Napster before this. But uh, <laughs> iTunes created a really nice uh, platform and they paid musicians about 50, between 50 and 60 percent. Of the money. So if you sold a million downloads for one dollar, you would have gotten five hundred or six hundred thousand um, dollars. So it's a really huge difference between a, uh, a really huge disparity between people paying a dollar for your song uh, versus people streaming, maybe paying eight dollars a month for Spotify and streaming your song unlimited amounts of times. Likewise, my wife and I, we released our first album in 2008 and we sold 2000 copies of that first album uh, just in person playing shows. We played a lot of shows back then with my wife's band. Uh, and we made almost $20,000 just selling 2,000 CDs over two years. So that's $10,000 extra a year in our pockets from selling physical CDs, uh, which, again, are nearing extinction. Um, so we're in a bit of a conundrum, uh, really, in, in the artist community. There, there, there are people that are, that are getting to that million, millions and millions of streams mark. Uh, and the people that are doing it as individuals are the most successful, of course, if you're doing it as a 10-piece band, like I am with Youngblood Brass Band. Youngblood Brass Band has three, four million streams a year. Um, you know, that's hardly any money at all. And so with a 10-piece brass band, um, that money ends up just going back into the band account and helps to fund the next tour. Artists who tour make a majority of their money on ticket sales and merch sales. And while at home, the artist must find, oh, I actually want to show you a snapshot of my... Uh, my streaming here. Let's see if it comes. Yeah, there it is. So this is my orchestra's uh, streaming numbers. And you can see uh, that this really uh, hits home uh, for me because I'm, I have, you know, over 10,000 people streaming my songs every year via Spotify, over a over thousand listeners. And I'm basically making nothing from that. Um, so it's really, it's a really interesting conundrum where an artist like me, who's sort of in this mid-level in terms of uh, fan engagement on something like Spotify. And, you know, my songs are 10, 12, 15 minutes long because I write big band jazz. Uh, I also have other albums and other bands on Spotify. This is just my orchestra. Um, but, you know, these, these numbers are, are piddly in comparison to, the band, to what you need in order to make a really significant amount of money from it. Uh, 
you know, according to the aforementioned New York Times article, the average song length in the early 2000s was at times more than four minutes. In 2020, that average song length has dipped significantly to three minutes and 18 seconds, and I believe it will continue to dip closer to two minutes and 30 seconds. With the pay per stream rate just fractions of a penny per play, today's songwriters are focused on repeat plays and frequently releasing new material, which means shorter songs and catchier hooks. For me personally, this hits home. My albums are streamed 10,000 times per year on Spotify. Unfortunately, my songs average 12 minutes in length. Do I get paid four times since my songs are four times the average length? No. Uh, where uh, my time listen stat is off the charts comparatively, uh, my number of streams and therefore payout in streaming royalties remains unsustainably low. While the, uh, on the other hand, while long form uh, composers like Maria Schneider testify in Congress uh, for more regulation and better pay for musicians and writers via streaming platforms, many, many young musicians are making their way to the bank with millions of streams per year, uh, releasing music recorded and mixed oftentimes in their home studios. So this is a, a way that people chase right now. It's not necessarily a good way, but it is. And some people believe it's the only way because this is how people consume music now is via streaming. This leaves me with two options as an artist. Do I abandon streaming and just chase other revenues, avenues of revenue? Uh, that's essentially what I've done, but I haven't completely abandoned streaming. I just have my stuff up there and I don't try to plug energy into it. Uh, or do I change the length of my songs? And now I've been thinking about actually coming out with a big band album that's all three to four minute songs to fit the, uh, to fit the Spotify stream model. So here we go. We're going we're gonna get, in, get into passive income now. Um, this is a really big one. Passive income is how artists will be able to make it. And uh, there's a few things on this list. Uh, the first is, uh, well, I'll just read here. There are several ways outside of streaming that an artist can gain passive income. And first, let's define the term. So passive income is money that is made without the need for day-to-day -day action. Uh, and, you know, I was working, I'll tell you a story. I was working an all-state jazz festival, it was a North Dakota all-state jazz festival, where I was directing the all-state big band, and there was a really big name artist, uh, also there, who was, um, who was, who was doing the combo. So I, I had the big band, he had the combo. Uh, this is an artist who has toured all over the world with John Mayer. He plays with Snarky Puppy, and he records uh, for more famous pop stars than I have time to list. Uh, over beers, he told me that all I needed to do was buy a second house. He said, "You already own one, right?" Just get a second one and start renting it out. Start building. And I was thinking, um, dude, we are broke. So rather than tell you, just purchase a small apartment building. Uh, I'm going to give you some attainable passive income streams uh, for any music artist. Here we go. Licensing. Uh, licensing is when you make your original music available to be used by licensing agencies to pitch to clients who need music for TV, commercials, film, and other online media. I wish I had chased this sooner. Any kind of music can fly here, even your weird big band jazz. But what these companies are looking for is a range of moods and vibes. The, the ability to cut out the lead voice, quote unquote, which is usually referring to vocals, and use the track as an instrumental uh, is also something that they request. My orchestra, Nookie Jones, Jan and Iber Group, Lulu's Playground have all had songs licensed, ranging from a small time YouTube series placement for a couple hundred dollars to seven to $10,000 placements uh, for use in commercials by companies like Chevrolet. And of course, the amount that you can make from licensing can be far greater than the heights that I've reached thus far. Uh, and the best agencies that I know, uh, they screen all the music that comes in. So it's possible that not everything in your catalog will be accepted. Take it in stride and build this part of your income over time. This is a really big one. I wish I had started it sooner. It's really become a, a lucrative part of, of my sustainable sort of my uh, passive income. The next one is the YouTube Partnership Program. So along with learning to edit audio in a DAW, today's musicians are also expected to learn to edit video too. Uh, and those two things function similarly in their pr respective programs. You actually, the, the, the functionality of editing audio is very similar to the functionality of editing video. So if you're familiar with audio, video is a very quick study. Um, these two things function similarly. If you're someone who loves to make videos, this could be anything like a podcast, music videos, meme videos that feature your music, uh, videos of you playing, videos of you teaching, uh, you can work your way towards 1,000 YouTube subscribers and 4,000 yearly watch hours, which is people watching your channel, at which point you can monetize your videos with ads. Now, having just passed this threshold myself recently, now I'm into, I've, I've started, as soon as I got to the 1,000 subscriber threshold, I started posting regular uh, videos. And shortly after that, I passed the 4,000 watch hours threshold. 
Uh, and now I've done tw about 20 educational videos over 20 weeks um, and have started monetizing my YouTube channel with ads. Uh, so having just passed this threshold myself, I can say that the revenue from the partnership program is much more significant in terms of dollars than any other streaming service that I'm on. For instance, a YouTube partner can earn up to one penny per ad uh, seen on their site. It's a sliding scale. So most people are below are around like, uh, you know, a quarter of a cent. Um, but that's still so much higher than that 0 0.003, 0 0.005 range that you get paid on Spotify. So it's a massive uptick in, uh, in, in your payment per someone watching one of your videos. And this, so, so what I've been doing is I've been releasing a mix of myself playing, uh, doing uh, like videos of, of my bands, but also educational videos, uh, like a regular series of educational videos. Certainly a worthwhile venture uh, as with any kind of monetization effort online, regular new content is key, even just once a week. This is the hard part. Everything, everything has a little bit of management. Uh, social media is another one. This is a loaded one. And like many of these categories could be its own presentation. Uh, each platform is its own beast. But what I believe to be the key to the entire, entire equation is that you point your fans to one singular place. So if you have a big Instagram following, but you're monetizing your YouTube channel, everything on Instagram should be pointing to YouTube. Uh, if you have a big TikTok following and you're trying to build your Spotify numbers, then everything should point towards Spotify. Uh, where can we stream your music? Where can we buy your merch? These things shouldn't really be questions you hear from your fans. They should know because you're tastefully beating them over the head with it while also bringing them that content that built your original following in the first place. So you want to continue that social media content that kind of got you to where you are as well. Fan engagement programs like Patreon, Bandcamp, and sites like Indiegogo and Kickstarter are all ways to engage your fans and build passive income. Uh, the latter two are more project-based, which usually uh, usually surrounding the creation of a new work uh, in a finite time frame. And the former two are places fans can actively support you monetarily over the length of your career. Patreon is the one that really sticks out in my mind. And actually, I think the people that made Bandcamp are the same people that made Patreon. So these are people like me that are thinking about ways to solve this issue. And it's a relatively new program. So you go find your artists on Patreon. Find your favorite artists. Uh, this is the one that sticks out in my mind. Fans can, can decide to support your career in a monthly amount. So in the same way that you might donate $10 a month to Minnesota Public Radio, you could choose to donate $10 a month to your favorite band or your favorite artist. Uh, in return, they get regular. Uh, so in return, you get regular updates, exclusive content, and the joy of watching your favorite artists succeed. Patreon is probably the least passive, quote unquote, in terms of the amount of work it takes to maintain a fan base, but it can be the most regular and steady income that you have over time. There are a lot of people making great livings on Patreon. Uh, live streaming is the next one, and this one is really big too, uh, especially now. There's been a lot of development in it over the last few years. Uh, live streaming, you know, is one that I'm going to throw in, and it's developed leaps and bounds since the start of the 2020 cor coronavirus and pandemic. In many ways, it may be the most sustainable and profitable method that exists right now. Uh, and all, all that work that you spent learning how to mix DAW audio and all that work that you spent learning how to get good looks in video, you can combine those to create a quality live stream experience for your fans. One such place to build this process is Twitch. So if you're a gamer, a person who plays a lot of games, you, you probably know Twitch because Twitch is a popular gaming platform where people cast their games that they're playing so other people can watch. Uh, but it's been taken over recently by musicians. So Twitch has primarily been used by gamers, uh, but musicians are starting to take over. According to Tracy Patrick Chan, who developed Spotify for Artists and developed the YouTube studio slash analytics, uh, he's now been tasked with building out Twitch music. So from January to September of 2020, the number of artists making $50,000 or more live streaming their music on Twitch grew by 750%. To quote Ari Herstan from his podcast, New Music Business, as of late October 2020, the median viewership for creators making over $50,000 was just 183 fans. Okay, I want to say that again. This is super interesting to me. As of late October 2020, the median viewership for creators making over $50,000 was just 183 fans. So this means the majority of musicians monetizing on Twitch are doing so with a relatively small audience, especially if you compare it to the numbers needed to make significant money on streaming sites like Spotify and Apple Music. On Twitch, this is another really fascinating stat. On Twitch, people are sticking around and interacting with the artist live stream for one to two hours on average compared to social platforms where live stream viewership ranges between two and four 
minutes. So the engagement on Twitch is so much higher than the engagement on a place like Facebook live stream or Instagram live. Uh, it's not even close. It's not even close. So if you're not turning this off and running to start a live stream on Twitch right now, you're doing it wrong. But don't turn me off yet. That's more. Uh, so the next thing here is NFTs. What is an NFT? This is new technology. This is this is total game changer technology. I've been super excited reading about this. Um, an NFT is a non-fungible token. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to read you a quote from Time Magazine. A lot of people are talking about this, okay? Uh, people are talking about it. NFTs are best understood as computer files combined with proof of ownership and authenticity, like a deed. Like cryptocurrencies, such as Bitcoin, they exist on a blockchain, a tamper-resistant digital public ledger. But like dollars, cryptocurrencies are fungible, meaning that uh, meaning that one Bitcoin is always worth the same as any other Bitcoin. By contrast, NFTs have unique valuations set by the highest bidder, just like a Rembrandt or a Picasso. So artists who want to sell their work as NFTs have to sign up with a marketplace and then mint digital tokens by uploading and validating their information on a blockchain, typically the Ethereum blockchain, which is a rival platform to Bitcoin. And doing so usually costs anywhere from $40 to $200. And they can then list their piece for auction on an NFT marketplace similar to eBay. Okay, so uh, this is wild. And you can see the headlines here. Um, NFTs are shaking up the world, uh, but they could change so much more. This here is a picture of an uh, artist called Beeple. And he created something called Every Days. Uh, so this is the first 5,000 days where he would do a piece of artwork, a digital piece of a piece of digital artwork every single day. Uh, he sold the first 5,000 days for $69 million. Uh, he, he created an NFT version of this, and it's the only one that exists. Uh, so what this is going to do is essentially this is going to put the power back in the hands of the artist. And what's really great about it is when you create an NFT version of something. So I'll, I'll give you a little bit of insider information, but I'll try not to divulge too much. Um, Youngblood Brass Band, one of the bands that I play with and tour with and record with, has been talking about this. This is the band that I said has three to four million streams a year on Spotify, a verifiably tenacious fan base who always shows up at all of our shows. Um, this is the kind of fan base that would love something like, you know, a wave file of our most famous song uh, as an NFT version, right? A verifiable uh, collector's item of our most famous song. Uh, and that famous song could go for who knows how much money. And even if the first time it sells, it sells for, say, $5,000, uh, the band makes that money, and then we decide what our commission is every time it's resold. So every time the next person, maybe the, maybe the value goes up, maybe the next person who owns it, uh, all of a sudden maybe Youngblood Brass Band gets a big, huge TV show deal, and that, that song, Brooklyn, now that NFT has, is now worth a million dollars. Now, if we've set our commission at 50%, we're going to make 50% of that next sale as well. So as long as this NFT lives, we will continue to make money on it every time it is bought and sold. Okay, This is completely different than how we functioned to this point. And what I believe we're going to see, especially as this technology, and you can see here uh, that there's a huge uh, carbon footprint with this technology because it takes a huge amount of processing power to create these non-fungible tokens. Uh, and especially when you are dealing with the larger amount sales uh, is my understanding. Um, but there's a lot of work being done to, to make this a much greener process. Uh, and I believe it will become a much greener process very soon. And if musicians aren't doing it, I, it you're not gonna magically build a fan base by creating NFTs, you have to build your fan base and you have to, your fan base has to know what NFTs are and, and, and believe that they're valuable. Uh, but I believe that this is the future for the valuation of art. I believe this is the future for the valuation of music, uh, especially digital, uh, anything happening digitally. At, the, at, at where it is now, I mean, you've seen the numbers. Artists cannot really make significant money uh, with their music digitally. And, and with something like this, uh, the, the fans get to decide how much the art is worth. Spotify doesn't get to decide how much the art is worth. The fans get to decide how much the art is worth. And when the fans speak, the fans speak. And as, of course, you know, Beeple fans, 
of course, there's art collectors on here, big, big money art collectors who are also trying to cut, sort of cash in on the on the on the fad. Uh, but I believe this is this is a long time, a long term thing. I don't believe this is just a fad. NFTs are helping solve the vital problem. Who owns digital artwork? All right. That's the, the headline here from The Guardian. So there's some really great articles on NFTs that you can read about. OK, I'm wrapping it up. To be an artist is to be an entrepreneur. And although that mindset is hard to come by for many artists, it is necessary to begin a career in music on solid footing. Does the jazz musician shorten their songs to fit the streaming model? Does the multi-instrumentalist rush to start a, live, a Twitch live stream? Do you make NFTs for all of your music or sheet music? I think each individual artist must make this call on their own and carve out their most lucrative uh, income slices based on what they do best. Uh, and that is hard to know when you first get in the game. It often reveals itself over time. There's no shame in working odd jobs, part-time, full-time, or any time to make ends meet. This is the reality of being a full-time artist. When I first moved to Minneapolis in 2008, I worked nights at UPS, and I cleaned a salon every Monday. My, when my wife says to me, we forgot to clean the salon, I still, my heart still jumps. And this was like a million years ago. Oh, no, we have to go there 2 in the morning and clean the salon before Tuesday morning. Uh, I, I also worked film shoots for a while before going completely full-time music. It's a long journey. It's a lifelong journey. And the grind continues for me even now as I sit here a full-time tenure track professor in, in my field. I still make weekly education videos. I still release albums. I still play shows and tour. And I dream up new projects. And keeping your spirit alive and filled with love and music is so important. I often joke with my students that the musicians who stay in the game the longest are the ones who win. As my father-in-law, lifelong artist and entrepreneur always says, focus on the music and the money will come. There you go. Adam, an honor to have learned from you. And, uh, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you a favor. Um, will you play something? Thank you. 